This podcast was recorded at a recent Breakthrough Live event. Our panel provided such great insights that we decided to share on our podcast platform. We asked our three guests to share insights on what it takes to build great culture and with experience in everything from recruitment to high performance sport to leading and coaching large teams, we uncovered some real gold. Hope you enjoy. We've all had our own experiences of what it looks like to build uh, good culture and I thought it would be helpful for us to get some insights from, from our panel here today on uh, their experiences, what they've seen work well, what they've uh, seen work not so well and learnings that we can take out of that and take it back into our own uh, businesses and our, our own teams. Um, so look, the, the kind of format that we're going to run here, um, I've asked if the uh, members could share kind of a 10-15 minutes of, of insights. First of all we're going to start with Orly Legault. Look there's a, a couple of reasons I was uh, very keen to have uh, Orly join the panel. First is uh, she has a background in recruitment. Uh, she headed the role of GM for Hayes Recruitment in Auckland. So has actually had that involvement of working a lot with organisations going as we recruit people into our businesses and into our organisations how do we make sure we recruit for uh, the right fit? How do we get that right at the start? Looking forward to uh, uh, Orly's insights and we will then uh, grab some questions from her as well. So a bit of intro, thank you for the initial introduction. Yes, I spent uh, a good chunk of my career to date in, in the recruitment world, so the agency recruitment world where we interact with a huge range of customers. Um, then I made the step into leading the talent team at Fletcher Building for the for the group and more recently I've stepped into a, a, an operations lead for Fletcher Living. So I've kind of had, uh, in a Fletcher Living there's a really, really strong culture and I get a real strong sense of what what it's like to build a, a, a strong culture. From a, a recruitment point of view, spent many many years, um, you know, taking briefs from customers and 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 asking them, you know, what first of all, why should a candidate come and work for you? That's really important. You know, customers usually focus so much, and hiring managers focus so much on the technical skills. These are the must-haves. Not so much being able to articulate. Well, why should somebody join your business? And, and describe your culture, you know, what's the cultural fit? Most people would agree that they want to recruit for cultural fit. Um, usually what I found is people prioritize technical skills and experience in the recruiting that like for like profile, recruiting almost a, a carbon copy of the person who's just left, um, which, you know, for a lot of reasons, tend not to work that well. Um, and so when asking organizations about or individuals about would well, describe the culture of your business, I can tell you 99% of the time, people can't answer that question. How do you describe the culture of your business? It, it gets talked a lot, but most people can't actually articulate it. And in my experience, because a lot of people haven't really thought about what is their culture. They talk a lot about values. Um, they talk about uh, goals and quite often will confuse um, their culture with the company goals. They're very different things. Um, or they'll talk to me about, or they'll say very generic things. They'll say, we're very customer focused here. That's our culture. Mm. You know, that doesn't inspire me. If, if customer is your thing, be customer obsessed. Don't be customer focused. And, and how does that transpire into everything that you do? How do you recruit individuals? If, if customer is really all you want to focus on and you want to hear the voice of the customer, then involve your customers in your hiring decision. Ask them for referrals. You know, who have you dealt with? Who have you had a fantastic customer experience with? Um, who's that person? Who's that little nugget? Where can we find them? Ask for feedback. What's important to them? And get them involved in that. Um, and again, you know, in terms of your, your overall culture and your business and how you run your business, how is that customer focus really, how does it come to life in your business? Uh, so I find a lot, of, a lot of businesses give generic terms to describe the culture. Or they confuse culture with office atmosphere. You know, we have fun culture. We, um, we socialize a lot. It's a work hard, play hard culture. If I had a dollar every time I heard that. <laughs> Uh, and and that's not culture. That's your you know that's your office atmosphere. That's the sort of and that can change. You know, if you're a big business and you've got different offices, different location, different branches, you'll find that you'll there will be different subcultures within each of those. And that's really the, the you know every single time you somebody leaves and you recruit somebody into a team, 
that culture or that office atmosphere changes, that changes the dynamics in terms of people getting along and being more social or not as social. Um, so that's not really, really culture as such. You know, your culture is to be, you've got to be really, you've got to think about your intent and the impact that that's going to have. Choose whatever you're going to, you, you know, whatever that is, that is the DNA of your business. Where do you want to be? So is that the customer voice? Do you want to be customer obsessed? Lose the focus word. Is it all about innovation? Are you are you a company that's always looking forward? So everyone that you you hire needs to be very curious and interested and very inquisitive and be someone who is always always researching what um, what else is happening, what's the next trend that needs to be in your DNA if if innovation is what you're you're all about. Um, Holly, can I ask a question? Uh-huh. So on the innovation track, in any organisation, we need uh, people with a bit of a mix, right, mm-hmm. of of skills and, and focus. So even if I'm a super focused innovative innovation company, how do I make sure that I can still bring people in that are the you know really good guardians who really do detail really well and do those kind of things where they may not necessarily associate with themselves being super innovative, mm-hmm. but they're a critical part of an innovative team. Yeah. How do you how do you blend them into that culture? You'd want to hire doers then. I mean, you need you need people who come up with the big ideas. You need people who can you know go and experiment and do fast fail and all of that. And then you need people who can do the execution well. So you recruit to that. But you'd want to recruit someone who's worked in that environment who's capable of working at pace and experimenting with different things and is comfortable in that space because you'll find if they haven't worked in that environment and they've worked in a very rigid this is our product this is our service we don't deviate from that and all of a sudden you throw them into an environment where there's 50 projects going on at any given time and you you know you're experimenting different things and it's super fast paced they're going to get lost okay chances are in in a a recruitment process Mm -hmm. how would you ask uh, questions to try and uncover whether someone was a good fit in that yeah. kind of scenario. It starts with really understanding. So, if 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 there's good, um, I suppose, synergies between the businesses they've worked in before, and maybe they're actually leaving that business because it's not innovative and it's not fast-paced enough, then that works as well. But it, you need to get an understanding of. Um, you know, that business they've worked for, you kind of want to research that a little bit. You know, where are they at? Are they quite a static business or are they fast paced? Do they innovate a lot? How do you describe Fletcher Living's culture? So before I say that, sure. before I answer that question, to me, if you can, a really great, a strong culture is, um, I guess, if you were to ask your entire staff, you know, all of your staff members, so the person who's been there since the beginning or been there 20 years, uh, as well as the new recruit, and if you were to ask customers as well as suppliers and, you know, all of the other satellite uh, organisations and individuals that that work around you, um, a really strong culture and when everyone, you know, has the same answer about you and and kind of verbalizes it in the same way slight maybe slightly different words but if if you've got a really common theme that's a really strong culture you know you why why should your customers describe you any differently to to your staff and particularly and again within your staff you know how do they feel about the culture there shouldn't be any difference between um, Jim who's just joined us last week or last month and and someone else who's been around for 20 years um, you know they should all feel part of the culture and they should all be able to articulate it if it's strong enough you exude that 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 culture all the time um, and there shouldn't be any variation in the way you're perceived in the market you know by your supplies your contractors you know anyone who interacts with us would like to think would say the same thing have we nailed it i don't know maybe you tell me but um so we build communities and everyone who works for us is community obsessed is that obsession and it comes through in everything that we do so um part of that is the voice of the customer but we really think very very carefully about the communities that we build um we want to build a, a range of homes that are um, you know, in a range of price points, we think about affordability, we think about the integration with the wider community, um, we think about the persona of all of our different customers and make sure that it's, um, the you know, we create that sense of community for them, regardless of whether you're a first home buyer, you're a single parent, you're a downsizer, you're a retiree, whatever it is, and that's that strong sense of community. I'm 100% confident that if you ask that to any of our staff, this is what you'll get. Um, I think our contractors are very much on the same page because they're, they're, they're very much part of that journey. Um, the wider public, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, probably not been there long enough to, to be able to know that. Um, 
my perception of the business before joining it was very much that, oh yeah, they build big communities. Mm. And do you try to blend the uh, meaning of community? There's a community in a building sense, as yep. in bringing multiple uh, people and families together into a physical environment. Do you also try to take the community uh, vibe or voice internally in your team, and how do you how do you display that? One hundred percent. You know, a lot of the the staff that we have, they're not they're not our staff. Most of the the actual people who build the homes, they're not employed by Fletcher Living. They're they're contractors and subcontractors, and a lot of them. I mean, we've grown a lot over the years, but a lot of them um, have been contracting for us for a very very long time, and they're part of the Fletcher Living family, and they um, they help us build those communities, and we involve them in the choice of materials and um, the way we build and and the way. Um, if we build on an existing, you know, sub-development, you know, subdivision, or if there's already a community living there, we're very, very conscious of the disruption to the community, and we involve them in, um, in, in making those decisions mm -hmm. and making sure we're at yep. least disruptive as we possibly can. So, yeah. An, an insight that we uh, share with our um, members here is you experience culture at you know with the maybe five or six people you spend the most time with each day, mm -hmm. and you talked about subcultures at, at different different branches. Mm. Um, do you actively help? your people across the organisation to understand what your culture is about and then is there particular skills you try to try to give to them so they can help deliver that culture experience inside the, the business? Yeah, if you think so our business we've got different different branches. Other businesses might call them franchisees, but we you know they they branches, we part of the same business, we talk the same language. And so you know that whole building communities ethos is in everything that we do and so a lot of that is driven from leadership so if you've ever met Steve Evans our, our chief exec he just he talks about community that will come out of come out of his mouth probably 15 times you know in a in a, in a conversation so um, so it starts from the top and every single time he engages with our teams um, with the branches that that's that that comes out a lot um, and then through every single project the, the whole community, how is this impacting? What's the impact? What's the benefit? What's the the potential risk to the community? It's that language is incorporated in everything and every process that we have. Um, and I guess if your um, if your big culture push is being customer centric, um, customer obsessed, again, you know, how mm -hmm. do you incorporate that into every single thing that you do um, at, across every layer of the organisation? You know, how does what finance does and the work that they do, how does that impact on the customer? Um, at, you know, across all functions, there should be no, no difference in the overarching theme of what they need to focus on and what they need to consider and stop and pause and think about every single time they change a process, implement yeah. something new. Yeah. And we, uh, I think we all face this challenge of when someone new joins our organisation of how do we embed them in the, in the culture and hopefully the positive aspects of our, mm. of our culture. Mm. Have you got an example of um, whether it be Fletcher Living or organisations you've worked with through Hayes or other mm. um, areas we've worked where you've observed someone do a really good job of, an, of helping uh, bring someone into a, into a culture? Yep. Um, I have plenty of good examples of, of people doing that. Um, if you think about... So again, back to that customer um, customer obsession thing. You, if you've recruited someone who's been referred to you by a customer, or perhaps it's come from one of your customers, not encouraging people to, you know, poach people from customers, but it, 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 I, I see it often leads to very good outcome. Um, so having them really heavily involved in, in those initial, um, you know, m meetings and hearing their voice and what they have to say and their perspective very early on, just because they knew doesn't mean they don't have a voice. So that's really important. Um, not don't just think of your new starters as you've got to feed them lots of information and you've got to induct them in yeah, the, good you know, the Fletcher Living Way or whatever your company name is. Um, involve them and seek feedback and involve them in that, that you know, what's important to your business. Um, another example I can think of, and it's very, very, very specific to their industry, but I am um, quite good friends with someone who runs a, not my food bag, but another one, <laughs> another one of those companies. And they... Um, they, you know, anyone who's recruited into that business, whether you're in credit control or, or, or marketing or anything, you've got to be a foodie. I mean, they, they just, you know, if you're eating cereal for dinner type person, there's no, there's no way you, you'd fit yep. in the culture yeah, that they're yeah, yeah. obsessed with 
food and making it easy for the customer to become a foodie. And so yeah. um, I guess from that point of view, they involve the, the new starters very, very early on. Again, whether you're credit controller or any anything yeah, yeah, yeah. that any right. role that you yeah. do um, in critiquing their menu and providing ideas and uh, creating, creating new dishes. So I think that's pretty neat yeah. um, because that's ultimately what they deliver and what their business is all about. And they live and breathe that culture. Yeah. How they good would their shared lunches be? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's yeah, a place you want to go for, pretty, go for the shared lunch. Pretty special, yeah. yeah. That's an extreme example because of you know the nature of the business, but that's done very, very well. So again, it's that ethos of incorporating your new person's ideas into what you do and what you live and breathe day in, day out. Recruiting to values and purpose is just as important as culture. And, and sometimes, um, I think I described that to you when we had coffee the other day, that culture is, you know, it's that group of people who kind of evolve, you know, in the same movement. They're all moving together towards the same purpose in the same same sort of way. And you're going to have people who are that that end who are very, um, uh, who are, you know, driving the culture more so than others. You're going to have people who are perhaps a little lagging a little bit more at the other end, and they still have a role to play, but they're still moving in the same way, in the same direction. If that makes sense. So purpose, you you know, they to me they separate things because your purpose can change over time potentially, and so so can your culture, but they because they are slightly different things in my view. That foodies business, you know, their purpose is um, if I think about when they introduced the business, it was to create an alternative to the other guys, and it was to provide. Um, to change the culture in, in New Zealand and their purpose is to bring, um, you know, really good um, food experience to, to New Zealand and make it as easy as possible for Kiwis to cook a three course meal and have a, a really shared meal experience. Um, and that's their purpose. Their culture is they crazy entrepreneurs they all they foodies they just live and breathe food and they you know in in that particular business everyone has a voice and everyone contributes so that's that kind of culture the ultimate purpose is to change the you know the way perhaps kiwis live and the way they have dinner at night um, that's a little bit different. Uh, now, Kevin Borovich and Kevin, uh, I was keen to have him because he brings uh, multiple perspectives into the room around around culture, um, involvement in high performance sport, and uh, also in uh, numerous organisations from uh, where he's the current GM of residential construction for Dominion Construction. Um, but uh, he also has spent time in the mines in Australia. Uh, worked in you know professional sport both as a as a player and and around that that environment. So I think he's going to have some uh, good stories to share. Kevin, over to you. Thanks, um, Brian. Um, there's a lot of words been spoken here today, and one in particular probably loyalty. And um, to kick off, I've known my wife since I was five years of age. I wrote a song about her when I was nine. Won the talent quest. Um, we got divorced at 11, she caught me going out with married woman. Um, but just a, a little bit about myself, that's who I am. I, I've had a head injury so I have to have notes. I don't know whether you know but back in 2001 there was the very first fight for life and I was an idiot who put my hand up. Back then there was a whole lot of 40 year olds trying to commit suicide for youth instead of for youth suicide. So uh, we raised a million bucks but in the, in the process um, my brain closed down for six months and I had to retrain it. So excuse me if I look at my notes, okay? So when, when Ryan asked me um, for my insight into observation of building a culture in sport and business, uh, I immediately thought I should share a story of a young man's journey in this, in this particular area. Um, through this story, you should identify how he built a culture by sharing his personal sporting and business experiences. So this man was the baby of 10. He had five sisters and five brothers. During his um, childhood, he faced episodes of violence, aggression, subjected to a tough um, upbringing. Along with this, he experienced a culture of love, compassion and loyalty. You see, despite all of this, these challenges, this young man still managed to hold on to a dream. He wanted to be like 
his surrounding heroes. Okay, for instance, his father, tough, unforgiving and strong, prisoner of war in Crete four and a half years, crushed by an 18 ton log, survived, raised 10 children, built a family home after it was burnt down, after two years. Um, his local hero, who had national, international fame, travel, respect, recognition, along with a ton of mana. One of the greatest All Blacks of all time. Breaking in his land by cutting an acre a day with a slasher. Okay, and after this he would run to the rugby club seven kilometres, train and run home. And lastly, the local, the local businessman who built half the town and shared his resulting wealth with the community that he served. Okay, the young man in, in the story identified that these heroes shared similarities. They introduced to him a work ethic at a certain level of high performance, as well as having an overarching purpose. I, I write here, he observed that his heroes lived by a winning culture. A winning culture. So his family of ten installed qualities with him of sharing, caring, working together and loyalty. When one person ate, everyone would eat in the house. The whole family would help harvest from the family garden and the boys would hunt with their father. And when the sisters called the cops, on the brothers were bra brawling in the backyard, <laughs> they stood staunch and denied any bad doings. He learnt from his sporting hero how to huddle. Now, the power of a huddle during a game would mean the difference between going home with your tail between your legs or going to, to the pub for a bloody good night. So huddling is a physical preparation to be able to work in a team. Knowing how to take pride in the actions you're, you're embarking on and knowing how to play and work with all different types of people. The young man also learned early on how to take responsibility and, and ownership as an individual. Working after school on the milk run when he was in primary. Completing his apprenticeship at the age of 18. And going on to captain nearly, nearly all his club and provincial rugby teams. Finally, he learnt from the businessman that work was built on hard effort and dis discipline. That listening, learning, living and giving were values to adopt. You see, little did he know that from all these different people, he was forming his own code and values to succeed and form his own winning culture. By setting realistic goals, he built towards his big goals, using bricks and smaller goals he achieved along the way. Giving praise, recognition and reward to his team, supporters, family, friends and even adversaries who inspired him to be better. Celebrating success, whether big or large, was extremely important. And most importantly, understanding that People are your best assets. He ahitia nia nui o au. He tangata. He tangata. He tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? The people, the people, the people. Okay. Now, 40 years on, older, and having a lifetime of learning, change and influence, we can now reflect on this older man's life and achievements. So his father, well he lost his father as a teenager, leaving a huge gap to fill. His father still continues to play a role in how he conducts himself, presents himself, applies himself to both work and play. His sport, he rose through the ranks of club rugby, became a New Zealand Colt, a junior All Black, a Māori All Black, he captained the New Zealand 15 and finally reaching his ultimate goal that he promised his father of becoming an All Black. With work, after, after the building apprenticeship, he went on to complete a certificate in sports coaching, 
focusing on physiology and psychology at Massey University. He travelled the world with sport, living in London and France, applying his trade and building a wonderful marriage with his wife, his childhood sweetheart. See, with the skills he built in rugby business and life, he started up his own construction and property investment company and ultimately grew to be a general manager and shareholder for a major construction company, which he is incredibly proud of. Through all of this, he learnt and acted upon one common factor that was influenced and inspired by his heroes and put it into practice in his own lifelong hard work. The one common thread was that forming the winning culture was his road to success. Ladies and gentlemen, leaving this final revelation until the end so I could discuss these points without you thinking I'm a fool of myself, making a fool of myself or being a big dickhead. <laughs> the man I refer to in the story, in fact, is me. Koringa i mau, ko waihau ara, ko mamari e waka, ko tararawa tiwi, ko nataringa te hapu, ko waihau nui a rua te marae, ko te fiu te whanau, ko Kevin Borovich ahau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Right, yes. Thanks, Kevin. So many uh, good insights. Insights there, and not only the uh, the insights, but the the passion and authenticity which which you deliver the story is uh, is humbling. Britta, Chris Jansen, many of you know Britta. Some of you are even lucky to have uh, experienced working with with Britta. Um, I called her earlier in the day, the uh, super coach. We just have immense respect for her knowledge and insight. Being able to. Uh, read what's really going on in the room and, I, and identify it and, and call it out is a very, very special skill. And she has uh, great insights, not only to the, let me call it the technical way the brain works, uh, the scientific aspect of the, of the brain, but also the very human, the heart-centered view of culture as well. Brother. Thank you, Ryan. Goodness gracious. So I thought when I was asked to speak today about culture, I thought, gosh, over 20 years of working as a business coach, I've seen a few things come and go. So rather than repeating a whole lot of stuff that you already know, I thought I'd just concentrate on a couple of things that I think have made a real difference to businesses over the years. Not necessarily things that I've done with them, but things that I've observed that I think are helpful. Um, and often some of the big lessons we learn about what not to do. But just before I start, I thought it'd be useful to give a little bit of a background. And so, for those of you who don't know me, I started business coaching on the 1st of March in the year 2000. And it was the same year that Peter Drucker, who's quite a well-known, he was a well-known management consultant, is attributed with saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Anyone familiar with that phrase? Yeah, so we've all heard it, and he's attributed with it. Whether he actually said it or not is, is debatable. But that was probably the first soundbite that I heard as a business coach um, around culture and it sounded a little bit like a soundbite in that sense of oh yeah it's a bit of a fad and so over the years I've really come to see the part that culture plays in a business. In about 2012 the London School of Economics did some research that was over a, t over a 10 year period and they looked at the impact that culture has over strategy in a business. What do you reckon is the ratio that they gave to strategy versus culture, or culture being more important than, than strategy. is a, a ratio, a multiple of something. What do you reckon the multiple is? Out of 100 companies over a 10 year period, their re research suggested it was eight times. So for some of us who think that strategy is the be all and end all, it's quite a equaliser, I reckon, just to realise how important culture is. And it's not to say that strategy isn't important. Um, I like to say that um, Culture without strategy is directionless. But strategy without culture has no power, has no impetus. So the, it's the culture piece that actually gives us momentum. And so I just wanted to share a few things that I've met. Today we've heard quite a few, so I'm just going to pick on the ones that we haven't discussed. Um, and I thought the first one is the way we talk about culture. So we use the word as, as a noun. And I think it's actually way more helpful to create a new word called culturing, because it's the process of doing. Culture as a, as a noun is static, but as we've discussed today, culturing really conveys a sense that it's constant, that it's evolving, 
that we're always having to work on it. And it's not static. So just because we've got a good culture now doesn't mean it's going to be the same culture in 12 months' time, two years' time, five years' time. So we need to be willing to evolve the culture according to what's happening in the business. So a couple of things that I've noticed. The first one is we've talked about culture as an overarching theme. I suspect that many of you, if you really looked at your businesses, will find that you've got multiple cultures. So we often talk about the silo mentality in an organisation. So a workshop has a, a culture compared to admin. And it's not that you can't have a unifying one, but it's being really aware of the different cultures that exist within the business. So the trick then is to align those cultures. I know some of you have got locations, Christchurch, Auckland, and I bet you you would say that the cultures are slightly different depending on the location. And we've talked a lot about values today, and I, th I think sometimes we can collapse values and purpose and culture into the same thing. Uh, but within that culture piece, and it's probably best to illustrate with an example, and that's around productivity as a, as a, a way of, we want productivity in a, in a company from a, a culture point of view, from a performance point of view. So compare a call centre in a business that measures its performance based on minutes and hours compared to the finance department that measures it on months, quarters or years. Same company, same culture of performance, but they're not actually in alignment when they're having the conversations in the organisation. So think about where your culture might be misaligned in the company. And often that's, that's a, a great way to bring that next level of performance into your organisation. Another one is trying to measure culture. So I, I heard somewhere here before about cult, uh, survey engagement sessions that you've, you've got. Yep, really useful, but not necessarily always helpful if you're trying to use it to measure culture. It's a bit like saying, asking your partner to give you a, a grade for how much they think you love them. Not going to get you very far. So same with, with culture. It's, it's not actually a good idea to, to measure culture. So what do you do instead? So instead of measuring culture, one of my suggestions would be to actually look at the KPIs that you have and ask yourself, how is our culture influencing that KPI in a positive or a negative way? How is it contributing to it? So productivity again. I, I work with a lot of construction people and they often have uh, gross profit per site work per day as a, as a measurement. If that number is low, it's very easy to say, oh, we need to, we need to push them harder. A more helpful question is to ask, what in our culture is contributing to that site worker per day GP being up or down? You'll get, you'll get a much better response from your team if you're asking the question, how, how is our culture contributing to it? And you're also given, getting some ideas on how you might be able to change it in a more, more productive way. And the other one that we haven't talked about today that I think is quite, quite helpful is it's not a switch that you turn on and turn off. And I think often we think we come to a session like this and we say, great, we've done culture, sorted. But actually, we have to work at it. It's a conversation that's happening all the time. Uh, I, I love the, the comment you made, Wendy, before about this person who, who you, who's handed in their resignation and we talked about the no dickheads. In construction right now, and I'm, I know quite a few are there, there's a real shortage of skilled people. And I was having a conversation with a client last week who is so tempted to recruit back a person that they kicked out because that desperation. And so we had to have... Exa well, exactly, and it's easy for us to say that because we're yeah, on the outside yeah, looking yeah, in. Yeah. But when yep. you have more work than you can, you can possibly do, you haven't got the skilled team, and you think, oh, I, they were not, not that bad, and we start making excuses for, for what their behaviour was like. So again, we've got to keep reminding ourselves of why we want to stay that course, because it's very easy to get duped into, oh, just this once we can figure it out. And I was just listening, when I was listening to, to Kevin, a little thing that, that I, I picked up on that I think is really useful in culture, and that is to create some rituals in how you run your business. Because rituals give us little milestones, little, little anchor points to have us connect. So the huddle is a form of a ritual. 
and that ritual forms part of your culture. And so as people come and go in your organisation, the rituals stay the same. And so it allows for people to, who, to come in and, and adapt way more quickly because there's already a couple of, of points within the business that, um, that they can adapt into easily. Uh, and probably just to finish up, is I, I listened to a podcast the other day of, from Warren Buffett and his comment that really stood out for me was about leading culture. And he said, leading culture is the leadership skill of the 21st century. So I think it just shows you that, that culture is far from being a fad. It's actually becoming more and more important. And some of the latest research coming out right now is showing how for millennials in particular, they are choosing the companies they work for based on the culture of that company. So providing that the remuneration is okay, they're actually looking for culture ahead of anything else. So that's something for us to, re to remember in the 21st century. Go I think a lot of people will say that culture is, it's the way we do the things that we do. I would add an extra bit and I'd say it's the why we do the things that we do. So when we're talking about a high performing team, why? Why is that going to be important to us? If we're talking about um, a, a, a fun environment, why does that matter? So it's the why that's going to drive the behaviours. Um, I think when we look at strategy, strategy is much more about the processes of what we do and the culture is more about the, the energy behind it. But I think it's a really challenging word to define and I think that most of us will have a slightly nuanced meaning for how we see culture and what's more important is that you as a team agree on what your culture is because it will be different to other, other businesses. Probably reflect a little bit of, of what Ollie was saying before, we've got to first let people know what it is and what it looks like to us. Um, one of the, the suggestions I have for, for a lot of my clients is how do you bring it alive? And so when you have your on meetings or whatever meeting that you have, ask questions saying, what have we done this week or this month that shows our culture in action? So you make it a, a living, a culturing part of, of the conversation. So look for ways to, oh, look, that's exactly the sort of culture that, we, that we're talking about. Or actually, <laughs> that wasn't quite what we were thinking. How do we get better at that? So bring it alive in, in the conversation. And on, on that same, same theme, uh, how do we bring uh, rituals into the breakthrough team? So one of the things we do is we have a, we call it a daily scrum, it's a huddle. Um, we are in an environment where we can't always be in the same physical location, so sometimes they're physical when we're all in the office together, sometimes everyone's on Zoom. We pretty much nail it every day, there's, there's the odd occasion where it doesn't work, but as a, I, I feel like it is a ritual for us. It's really simple in terms of what we run, we're like, what is your, what is your success from yesterday? Where did you win yesterday? What was your success? And, and what what's contribution are you looking to make today? Not what are you going to get done, not what's your most important task, what's, not what's most urgent, what's your contribution. And I could, I could defer to Mike, but rather than deferring to him, I'll just get you to read, your, read his paper on contribution. Game changing in terms of your thinking. But it's changing, changing the language we use, you know, productivity, you can, you can do a hundred tasks that add no value to the organisation, do them really quickly and really efficiently and you're like, man I was productive today! And you added no value whatsoever. Sometimes the biggest contribution you can make is the 10 minutes you spend talking to a team member to find out what's really going on in their world. Not what's going on in the project they're running, what's really going on in their world. Sometimes the, the biggest contribution you can make is the 10 minutes you spend staring out the window going, how could we do that thing better? What was our learning from our last thing that didn't go quite so well? But that 10 minutes you spend thinking there might be the biggest contribution you, you can make to the organisation for the month, not the productivity thing. So think about that, uh, that language. We tend to focus way too much on strategy and the KPIs that come out of that. And one of the reasons we do that is because there's a clear yes, no, black, white result. And so it gives us certainty. The thing about culture is it's very hard to, to quantify, to measure. And because of that uncertainty, we tend to defer to what we can measure. 
Uh, and I think that's a bit why we can be a little bit lopsided in our businesses. We're all pretty good at measuring and doing the strategy piece. We're not so good at putting the same time and energy into the, the culture piece because it's harder. <laughs> they, we call it a soft skill. It's not soft yep. at all. It's blimmin' hard. Yep. Team, I'd like you uh, to join me in thanking our panel. Very uh, appreciative and deep gratitude for you guys giving up your time, uh, your insights and being so open to uh, sharing with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.